It's an honor and privilege to welcome uh, what I would consider one of our own, a very good friend, uh, 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 Jim Saunders. Jim and I were fellows together and uh, of course share many memories. Uh, he has gone on to excel in many different ways. He's currently a professor at Dartmouth and is also uh, the chair of the Global Coalition of or the Coalition for Global Hearing Health and has served in uh, that capacity and uh, for several years and also many other capacities regarding uh, global hearing. So uh, Jim, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to what you have to say. We're about herding zebras. <laughs> I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a catchy title, title to give pe get people's attention. I, and I realize this is a little bit uh, different from a lot of the talks that that have been sort of very uh, basic science uh, involved. But I, I think uh, you'll appreciate by the end of the talk that the intersection of of sort of science and uh, and service uh, in hearing health is 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 a, is a natural fit. Uh, at least it is for me. So, um, so first of all, I have no uh, financial relationships or affiliations uh, to disclose. I wanted to start with kind of a word of thanks. Um, you know, I I have Howard's book on my on my desk right now, which is a, a great. Uh, a, a, you know, it's uh, I can just uh, see him sitting by the sitting in his home, uh, giving telling the stories, and they're all down in print. But, but I think the 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 title of the book really captures, uh, I think, the spirit uh, of of the House Institute, and I and I think both how my getting to know Howard and getting to know all of my mentors during that period of time really instilled with me a, a sense that this that this work of of improving hearing health care for for everybody is really bigger than any of us individually and and i've been really blessed uh, through my work uh, uh looking at this on a global uh, scale to really continue that have that spirit and 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 uh and sense of, of purpose uh to this day so i'm very very thankful for all of you for for helping to instill that in me so first, just a little bit about how big the about the problem, about how big the problem is. So the the uh, WHO estimates that currently uh, there's about 465 million people in the world with disabling hearing loss, and this is considered their criteria for that is greater than 40 decibels in the better hearing ear. And, and if you put that in perspective, that's roughly the entire population of the United States and Mexico combined. Uh, so that many people on the planet have disabling hearing loss. Uh, when you include milder forms of hearing loss, uh, it's the numbers much, much bigger. And both the uh, Global Burden of Disease Project out of University of Washington and uh, the WHO agree that that number currently is about 1.5 billion. Uh, and as you'll see, is, incre is, is increasing um, every year. Um, the global burden of disease ranks hearing loss as the fourth leading cause uh, of the years lived with disability, and the second most important uh, impairment in terms of uh, in terms of disability adjusted life years, which is how they measure sort of overall global burden of disease. Uh, that's uh, just just behind anemia, uh, and it accounts for about 1.58 percent of the overall global burden of disease, which doesn't seem like very much. Uh, but this is really only slightly behind diabetes. Uh, so it's a pretty significant thing. Uh, there's a great, uh, last year, uh, the WHO launched the World Report on Hearing, which is a great reference for those that are interested in more sort of overview about uh, hearing loss in the world and how we can, how we can better correct that. So as I said, it's a uh, the, the numbers are on the rise. We're certainly not getting control of this by any means. And, and this is partly, I think, because of we're living in an aging planet. And uh, as, we, as, uh, as the human race grows older, we can expect more hearing loss, uh, 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 you know, just because of the uh, age-related factors. Um, but it, and it's probably also to a certain degree because of the, um, because we're just getting better data. So we're, we're, you know, all of these are kind of estimates. And as we get better data, as we scratch the surface a little bit deeper, uh, we're finding that the numbers are actually much bigger than we, than we thought they were. So, you know, as, as you, I'm sure know that 
this is all very much related to socioeconomic status. And this is just looks at the prevalence of disabling hearing loss in, in various high income and in various income uh, strata and socioeconomic uh, uh, strata. So when you look at high income versus low income, there's about a five times incidence in low income uh, uh, countries uh, compared with high. And of course, the problem is that 80% of the people in the world live in those low and middle income countries. And so uh, really only a small percentage of us live uh, in places where we have uh, reasonable access to care. So we have a high rate of hearing loss and uh, poor access to care. Uh, this uh, just looks at uh, the uh, access to otolaryngologies uh, specifically, well, otolaryngology and audiologists specifically. And uh, so you see that, you know, low income countries have virtually no otolaryngologists. I know Daryl and I uh, both uh, have a good friend in Malawi. He's the only otolaryngologist in 14 million people. Uh, and so there's this disproportion of an extremely prevalent disease uh, and a very low access to care. And so how do we, how do we sort of combat that? How do we deal with that problem? Uh, well, some possible solutions. So I think uh, looking at better service delivery, getting better ways to, to expand our service. Uh, this in the upper right-hand corner is a project which we recently uh, completed screening uh, Nicaraguan school children and using community health workers and a tablet-based system uh, to, to, to uh, screen, we screened a little over 3,000 uh, kids in that project. Uh, and so I think uh, using sort of non-professional uh, providers, uh, it, which is exactly what uh, Wakisa Walafua in Malawi is doing, uh, and also using advanced technology to really sort of improve access to care. Uh, really trying to reduce the cost of both hearing aids and cochlear implants. Uh, the lower uh, right-hand corner is a, is a study that we did a few years ago and have actually done several of these all uh, in, in various regions of the world. Uh, this particular one is from Africa and looking at the cost effectiveness of cochlear implants in those uh, low income environments. And you can see um, the sort of cutoff for cost effectiveness is, is a level of three. And so most countries, uh, if, well, if you can get the devices down around $10,000, uh, most countries uh, are cost effective for cochlear implantation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, that we still need the systems and reducing all of the other associated costs uh, to make that accessible. So it's not enough to just have low cost devices, you have to have an accessible system. But what I really want to talk about today is the third thing, and that is really preventing hearing loss to begin with, uh, what we call primary prevention. And so in, in public health sort of parlance, uh, uh, they divide prevention into sort of three levels. Uh, and so primary prevention is you prevent the disease uh, from, from ever happening. Uh, you know, an example here would be vaccinations for meningitis, uh, for pneumococcus uh, to prevent meningitis and otitis media. So you're actually preventing the disease from ever happening. Uh, and that's referred to as primary prevention. That's kind of being my focus today. Um, but uh, secondary prevention would be you're treating the disease to, to, uh, to avoid the disability of that disease. So an example of this would be surgery for uh, otitis media to improve hearing, or a great example, I think, is, is stapedectomy surgery, where the disease still exists, but we've, we've subverted the, the disability that's associated with that disease. And then tertiary prevention is what we're generally about, especially when it comes to sensory neural hearing loss, uh, hearing aids, cochlear implants, uh, uh, education programs. So you're trying to reduce the handicap or reduce the disability by, by uh, intervening and providing um, rehabilitative uh, type uh, uh, measures. So in, in global health, generally speaking, primary prevention is always gonna be the preferred approach uh, if possible, and it's always gonna be the most cost-effective approach. And so in order to really look at primary prevention and make progress in that, we have to uh, really understand the specific etiology 
of, of hearing loss uh, and, and specifically of sensory neural hearing loss. We need to know what the causes are in order to provide prevention. And one of the problems is that is that we don't have a lot of data uh, on that. So this is a this is a recently published study by the uh, IHME. This is the Global Burden of Disease Project, and 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 they sort of brought uh, are looking at the causes of hearing loss that could be identified within their data set, and you can see congenital, which is just kind of a broad term. We, you know, it doesn't it's not very specific as to, uh, for example, as to a specific genetic cause. Uh, otitis media is in the green bar. And then the vast majority of this is what they call age-related and other. And, and I've always hated this term because age-related and other really just means we don't know. Uh, and, and so it's a very nonspecific sort of idiopathic description. Uh, you can see these early neonatal hearing losses definitely didn't have age-related hearing loss. So it really should be just other, including age. When I think as otologists, we're sort of partly to, I mean, we, we do this in our own practices as well. And I think because traditionally we've not really had uh, treatments to offer specific types of sensory neural hearing loss, um, we've just sort of grouped those. And I don't know how many times I've, I've uh, you know, talk to patients and say, this is, you know, you have this high frequency hearing loss, and this is probably related to age and noise and other common things, just kind of including that in that sort of overall blanket. Um, and, and so, you know, when it comes to conductive hearing loss, we're much more specific about trying to identify the cause, the specific treatment, the specific antibiotic, what surgery do they need. But when it comes to sensory neural hearing loss, we, we typically move, you know, pretty much right towards the rehab, towards those those tertiary treatments uh, uh, hearing aids cochlear implants etc so what do we know about uh, the etiology of hearing loss kind of in the in the in the world we we know that common causes are still prevalent people still age presbycusis is still prevalent uh, in those things we know that there's a lot of variations within uh, within the within both the developing world and low income uh, countries. Uh, we know that many diseases because they don't really have access to treatment are more severe and more advanced. A and uh, we, know, we know, and I'll try to really convince you this in the next few minutes is that rare causes uh, may, that rare causes in, in our practices may be fairly common in those, uh, in those lower income countries. And a lot of this depends upon it, where you are and, and what type of hearing loss we're talking about. So some common factors within, the, within low income countries are malnutrition. Um, most places have relatively poor pre prenatal care. Uh, meningitis is fairly uh, common. The, what we sometimes refer to as the big three, the things that get a lot of attention on the global health are these infectious disease etiologies, these communicable diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And all of those uh, have potential impacts on hearing loss. And then, um, and then poor access to care, uh, which means infections go untreated, tumors go untreated, uh, and, then, and then a lack of regulation about the things that are potentially cause hearing loss, such as noise, ototoxic medications, industrial toxins, and, and pesticides. But I think it's a real, it's a common fallacy to think of the, the sort of, quote, developing world as uh, sort of this, you know, uniform flat space where, where one size fits all. And if we just figure out one uh, thing, uh, we we've we've solved the problem these are uh, you know a small village in rural nicaragua uh urban city in 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 ecuador and a, and a village in africa and all have very very different uh, risk factors that we have to account for uh, so the the key here is variability not commonality uh, and that just as evidence of that, this was a study uh, or a series of, of surveys that we did years ago, looking at uh, children uh, in, in the school systems in rural Nicaragua. And you'll notice that at this point we were, we were using a just basic, you know, a 
basic portable audiometer with really very little uh, noise protection. And that's a, a whole nother talk in itself. Um, but, but what was interesting about this was that in these rural villages, all within the same country, all in the same state of the same country, all within a few miles of each other, what we found was that there was a, a huge variability in the potential etiologies of the hearing loss. So, so this, uh, this shows the percentage of those identified with hearing loss that had a positive family history and the percent that, that presented with signs uh, of an ongoing infection. And each of these bars are different schools and, and, and what you see is that some schools had a lot of infections and others had almost none and others had a lot of families that were affected and others relatively small. So this is probably a, a more isolated community with more consanguinity. And this is perhaps a, 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 a town that had a, a, you know, poor uh, sanitation, poor water, uh, uh, poor access to clean water, those kinds of things, which we know lead to higher infection rates. So even within the same part of the same country, villages just a few miles apart uh, had really dramatic differences in their, in their cause. And it also depends a little bit on, on which side of the tuning fork you're on, whether you're talking about conductive loss or sensory neural loss. Uh, so, and one of the really uh, common fallacies, I think, is that, is that uh, oh, well, these, um, sorry, I guess <laughs> my Spotify just kicked in. Um, so these, um, one of the common fallacies is that, oh, well, the biggest problem in, in uh, the developing world is that, uh, is that people have conductive loss because they have infections. And if we just treat the infections, then that'll solve the problem. Uh, and that's really not the case. It, conductive loss is more common because of that lack of treatment, um, but it's not the dominant hearing loss, as I'll show you in a minute. But within conductive hearing loss, uh, this is just shows the otitis media prevalence. And you can see this is general population. In some places, it exceeds uh, 4% uh, of the general population has chronic separative otitis media. Uh, and, and so it is, it is fairly common. And in fact, because this is so closely linked to, to clean water and clean housing and, and general sanitation, uh, the WHO considers any time when the when the chronic separative otitis media incidence uh, or prevalence rather reaches over four percent, they consider that to be a general public health crisis uh, because it's an indicator for such poor uh, sanitation and socioeconomic status. But the things that cause conductive hearing loss uh, are really pretty similar to the things that we treat in our everyday practices. Uh, as you'll see, cerumen is actually fairly common uh, and very treatable uh, problem. And this just makes sense. You know, we're talking about a mechanical uh, system here. There are only so many things that can go wrong with that. Um, and so when you think about conductive hearing loss, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be the common, the common things really are most common. So this, you know, I learned in medical school, when you think, when you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras. And so that's true for conductive hearing loss. But the diseases are typically much more advanced, as we've already said. Uh, this is rather striking here. One study in South Africa uh, looked at cholesteatoma, and 25% of the cholesteatoma is presented with intracranial complications. And, and other studies have kind of borne this out, that intracranial complications, especially from untreated cholesteatomas, are, are really fairly common in these low-resource environments. The other thing is that other, other uh, uh, infectious uh, etiologies can play a role. Uh, tuberculosis uh, can play a very high role uh, in presenting with uh, in separative otitis media. Uh, as you can see, uh, over a third of uh, children in Angola. And, uh, and uh, chronic uh, otitis media is fairly common in the HIV population. 
So when you think about conductive hearing loss, there are horses, but you think about sort of charging, angry, scary horses uh, that you have to be, there's a lot of danger involved. So you tread carefully. When you talk about sensory neurohearing loss, which is actually the most common type of hearing loss, um, it, it is, uh, it's actually is more rare uh, or rare, uh, what I would, what we would consider to be rare causes are, are more common. Uh, there's more variability, let's say. So some of this experience uh, comes from uh, some work that I've been doing in a clinic in Nicaragua uh, for a little, a little over 20 years now. And we looked at our clinic data. So this is uh, looking at 2000 audiograms uh, in that clinic over the first 10 years of existence. And the blue bars are sensory neural loss. Uh, the, the red bars are conductive loss and the green, which you can barely see there are mixed losses. And so what you see is that even within this population of having relative, relatively poor access to care, sensory neural loss across all of the ages, this is age along the x-axis, across all of the ages, sensory neural hearing loss was the most common uh, type of hearing loss we saw. And it's interesting that we see this bimodal pattern here so that we see uh, in the sensory neural hearing loss, we see more uh, sort of kids presenting with sensory neural hearing loss. And then of course we have the sort of expected uh, uh, age, you know, expected uh, hearing loss in the older population. Uh, but we see that kind of bimodal pattern with sensory neural hearing loss. And it was actually that that really got my interest in the beginning. When I first started going to Nicaragua, like everybody, I was expecting to just see a lot of otitis media and just be treating a lot of kids with otitis media. And instead, what I saw was a lot of kids that needed hearing aids because they had sensory neural hearing loss that I wasn't equipped to treat. And so in, at that point, engaged audiology and got really a hearing hearing aid program, and then later even some cochlear implant programs. But sensory neural hearing loss is, is more common. And this has actually been borne out by other people in other, in other, uh, in other places around the world. So when you think of sensory neural hearing loss, this is where the zebras come in. So uh, it's not gonna be the common things that we see in our everyday clinic. Uh, and, and the variability is, is huge. Uh, so this is a, a, some pooled uh, data from different studies looking at the causes of, of hearing loss uh, in their populations. You can see otitis media here, which we would have expected to be uh, relatively common, is a, is a relatively low percentage, at least in these reports. And of course, these are not population-based studies. These are just clinics reporting what they're seeing. Um, but you can see a lot of variability, some common things, ototoxicity is fairly common, particularly in some, some places, uh, genetic, uh, fairly common, uh, a fairly high amount of uh, meningitis and other vaccinated uh, preventable diseases. One of the things to, that we found that I think is borne out in other studies is that when you look at risk factors, there's often multiple causes. And so this is data from uh, 100 uh, uh, Nicaraguan children. We just, we just uh, recruited uh, kids with, with the hearing loss. We ended up seeing almost all of these were profound hearing loss. So my point here was that, um, was that our experience in that, um, in Nicaragua, this is, a, this is a study that we did where we looked at um, 100, uh, roughly 100 deaf kids. So these were kids that had profound uh, hearing loss and onset in childhood. And what we found was the variety of different risk factors, uh, but many of them had overlapping risk factors. So many of them would have uh, gentamicin and also a perinatal infection or a family history and gentamicin. So there was a lot of kind of overlap. So, so I think it's, it's what, what makes this zebra herding more difficult, if you will, is that oftentimes there's overlap. And we see this, I think, in our general practice as well. You know, you have people that have family histories and are also, uh, you know, older patients that have strong family histories and there's kind of an overlap between genetics and, uh, and presbycusis. 
So what I wanna do is just deal a, a dive into a few different specific etiologies and just talk a little bit about what we know and some of the work that we've been doing in these various areas. So the first is ototoxicity. And when I think about ototoxicity, I, um, I want to think about what is the risk of the of the specific agent that we're that we're talking about, the specific uh, uh, drug or or chemical, and then how big is the exposed population? Because some things are fairly uh, fairly uh, toxic, like cisplatin, but the exposed population is actually relatively low. Um, so with aminoglycosides, it's by far the big hitter here. And so the ototoxic risk is relatively high and the exposed population is huge. And you'll see uh, later in a, in a recent uh, sort of meta-analysis that we've done, uh, we estimate that uh, almost 20 million people uh, have a hearing loss, new uh, incident, new onset of hearing loss each year because of aminoglycoside exposure, just because the prevalence is so high. Uh, in China, it's a, it's a commonly uh, considered to be the most common cause of hearing loss, uh, accounting for uh, you know 20 to 30 percent of the deaf population, uh, about five percent in Africa, and in our study in Nicaragua, 32 percent of our deaf uh, children were exposed to to, to gentamicin. Uh, there was a, there was a question obviously about genetic susceptibility. That there were six of those kids that also had strong family histories of hearing loss. Most of those kids were, the gentamicin was, uh, was uh, given without a prescription and generally for a non-indicated uh, disease, uh, such as an upper respiratory infection. And we also found that they were geographically clustered. And we think that this probably has to do with increased availability to, to, medi to medications, to healthcare, and therefore to, to drugs. Uh, we looked then at those uh, at those that were genomized and exposed, and in our Nicaraguan population, we found no uh, no uh, mitochondrial mutations. So I was really uh, interested to know whether or not uh, there was a predisposition to the genomized toxicity, which there was not in this population. So, so that to me means that the problem here is sort of inappropriate access to care, inappropriate access to drugs. We just um, I just recently had the, the pleasure of, uh, of working with Lauren Dillard, who's a PhD audiologist in, in Colorado, uh, and uh, looking, doing, did sort of a scoping review of overuse and self-medication in the aminoglycoside. And uh, we found just in the general population, uh, pretty variable responses, but in some studies, almost 15% of the general population had taken an aminoglycoside without a prescription. This is just, uh, just I think, outstanding to us that live in a sort of regulated world where you, uh, where you would never think to just go to the pharmacist and say, what, do you, what kind of drugs do you have for me today? I've got a, I've got a cough, what do you have? And here's a, here's a needle with some genomycin. And so the problem here is, of course, widespread access, uh, but also, uh, really complete uh, deregulation in terms of any kind of monitoring of doses or, uh, or levels or any of those things that we consider important with aminoglycosides. Um, we've recently uh, launched a, a survey through the Global ONHNS uh, initiative uh, that will look at a little over 300 uh, ENT providers in that uh, initiative. Uh, and we're, we're interested in really learning more about uh, global uh, practice patterns in terms of aminoglycoside and cisplatin use. So in terms of prevention, the, the key really for those, uh, those uh, patients, people that are getting these uh, over the counter, um, the real key is gonna be public awareness. And so, this is a, some public awareness uh, brochures that we developed some years ago uh, for, for Nicaragua and trying to educate both providers and the public about the risks of, uh, of hearing loss with aminoglycosides. Uh, the other thing is, what about a non-ototoxic uh, non aminoglycosides? Well, frustrating uh, as it is, this actually already exists. Uh, in the veterinary world, uh, they do have, um, um, 
aminoglycosides that have equivalent antimicrobial activity, uh, but are non-ototoxic and non renal uh, non-nephrotoxic. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is just blows my mind, but the, the reality is making uh, genomycin is so cheap and lucrative and no drug company has really any interest in developing these uh, non-toxic alternatives. Uh, in the veterinary world, you just don't have those FDA sort of uh, regulations. And then what about uh, pretreatment or, or, or co-treatment with other uh, things? Uh, there's a, a great uh, a study a few years ago by, uh, by Yogan Schock, uh, look, giving aspirin at the same time as uh, gentamicin. And uh, in, this is the guinea pig hair cells over here on the right side. And they actually did a follow-up study in, uh, in uh, China. Uh, where they gave uh, half of the subjects uh, uh, high-dose aspirin, which is a problem for the pediatric population, which is, I think, where a lot of these risks exist. Uh, and, and the other half didn't give the aspirin and saw uh, you know, almost fourfold reduction in uh, ototoxicity risk. And then the other uh, drug, which I think is near and dear to our hearts, uh, which also has some efficacy in terms of preventing um, Preventing ototoxicity is uh, is uh, in acetylcysteine. Uh, so NAC has also been uh, shown in uh, multi-drug resistant uh, TB. Uh, so you know, public intervention, alternative drugs, uh, uh, alternative aminoglycosides that are not toxic, uh, or co-administration of other things, all are effective ways of, of primary prevention. Uh, the other thing I want to kind of skip down the list here and, and talk just a little bit about industrial chemicals and environmental toxins, because this is where a lot of my work is, is going right now. Um, several years ago, we had an opportunity to do a study in the, these artisanal mining communities in, in Nicaragua. And so these are small, uh, small scale mining, usually family run businesses uh, where um, where they uh, mine, that bring up the ore, these are gold mining communities, bring up the ore. And just in exactly the same way that the conquistadors extracted uh, gold, they take the ore, mix it with mercury, which this is a large vat of mercury. Uh, and this stone is being drug around to grind up the mercury and the, and the gold. And this is powered by an old Chevy engine, which is sitting off to the side here. This child is sitting by that bat, and right before I took this picture, he was playing patty cake in that bat of mercury. And then what they do is they burn off the mercury. So, the, so this, uh, uh, they burn off the mercury, mercury vaporizes, and then what's left is the, is the gold extract. Uh, and so this creates this mercury vapor, which uh, sort of affects everybody. And so we were curious about what was the effect of mercury, uh, specifically on hearing loss in this population. So we did uh, a series of studies uh, using a, a, a previous version of our, our, our tablet system. Uh, and we weren't really able to identify a correlation with, between, them, between mercury and hearing loss. But what we did see was we saw a lot of hearing loss in these population. And the problem is that there's a lot of overlap with noise. As I said, the, this, the etiologies are often uh, difficult to sort out. Um, but we saw a lot of individuals that had high levels of metals, but there really wasn't a statistical correlation. Uh, but, but what we did see was that, was that mercury was not the only heavy metal in this population. So lead, aluminum, manganese, and arsenic were all present in levels that far exceeded what were considered safe uh, levels. So right now, we're, uh, we just launched a study uh, to look at uh, kids within this population, hoping that we will uh, be able to sort of tease out some of the noise exposure aspects of this. And uh, doing a, we've created a tablet-based uh, central auditory processing uh, battery, which includes six uh, tests, uh, and uh, in, in, in addition to standard audiometry with our tablet-based system, and this is available, we have this in Spanish and English. And I, I hope that this uh, tablet-based system will help us to kind of unlock uh, perhaps the, 
central uh, auditory processing effects of these heavy metal toxins. Uh, so we're looking forward to reporting uh, more on that uh, next year. So um, the other thing with it in regards to environmental toxins, so um, we just completed this large scale study of school children, as I mentioned. Uh, this is uh, the, our, our uh, techs, uh, at their request, they, uh, we bought them motorcycles so they could access some of these communities. And this is basically an entire uh, audiology suite uh, uh, mounted on the back of a, of a motorcycle. And um, we then followed up with uh, clinic visits for those that identified with hearing loss. Uh, we had a fairly high compliance rate of about 76%. But what I really want to focus on is those clinic findings. Um, so, so first of all, when we brought those in, we brought those kids that failed that school screening into the clinic. Uh, about 30% of them passed their test in the clinic. About 40% had cerumen impaction to be the presumed cause of their hearing loss. Again, common things are more common. And when we look at the sort of permanent hearing losses here, again, we saw sensory neural hearing loss was much more common than conductive hearing loss. Well, when we, when we really went back and analyzed those risk factors uh, for within those kids that actually did have hearing loss, uh, two things stood out, maternal drug use, which we're, we feel like our tool, our uh, questionnaire tool was not very precise for that. So, but the other thing was pesticides, the presence of pesticides in the home had a strong correlation between those kids that had that passed their hearing test and those that didn't. And, and it turns out um, we didn't really see this coming. This was a bit of a surprise, but it turns out there's there that uh, children in these environments, particularly in these agricultural environments, are, are commonly exposed to these uh, pesticides. 92% uh, of kids uh, in, and that live near peanut farms, uh, uh, high prevalence in uh, kids that live near crop, crop dusting airports. And, and pesticides have been linked to renal disease and, and other diseases, but not really uh, ever, or, or let's say the association with, uh, with hearing loss is, is still relatively unknown. Uh, there have been some studies looking at, uh, at children working on farms, but again, you get that, that noise exposure uh, sort of confounding uh, variable. Uh, so we've just put in for an R01 to look at, uh, specifically uh, looking at uh, pesticide exposure and, uh, and hearing loss in a, in a broader, a, a widespread study in, in Nicaragua. The next thing uh, on the list is noise-induced hearing loss. So um, this is a hugely common uh, problem. Uh, seven to 21% of adult hearing loss uh, is felt to be related to noise. Occupational noise is a major problem in these countries, uh, primarily because of the lack of regulation. Um, in Latin America, almost a third of countries have no regulation on the industry. And even when it's present, it's often not enforced. Uh, and then it can be also aggravated by toxic exposures like the, like the things that I just mentioned. This is kind of a little uh, sort of diagram that I think of uh, when I think about um, uh, occupational noise exposure. Um, the, you know, you have very primitive uh, agricultural environments down here, which probably have relatively uh, little occupational noise. I think these are becoming, uh, this is a smaller and smaller population over time. You have this sort of in, uh, in de developed countries over here where you have uh, where you have really good regulation, but those that fall in the middle is where I think the highest risks are. Those that are exposed to those uh, occupational noise but don't have really any regulations. And just to show you, I don't know I don't know if you can hear the sound on this, but this is a 15 year old boy who's working in one of those mining communities. And this is a metal uh, 50 gallon drum that has metal uh, balls in it. And he's grinding that, that metal, uh, that uh, gold ore and, and mercury into kind of a slurry. So if you can imagine uh, when I was a kid, I had these rock polishers that tumbled rocks. And if you can remember, just take that times a thousand. Uh, and you can see what he does when, when he starts this. 
So you can see he's His, hear, his hearing protection is he, it, I, we didn't ask him to do that. He sticks his finger in his right ear because he knows he can't hear out of his right ear because it's facing those drones. So the other uh, thing I think, which sort of goes across all uh, both uh, low resource and high resource environments is non-occupational recreational noise with the increased use of smartphones uh, the exposed population here is huge. We don't really have a great handle on, on how big the risk is uh, for individuals that are listening to smartphones. It's kind of hard to, to tie that down because it depends on how much and volume, et cetera. But the WHO has done some really nice things. They've got a program called Make, Make Listening Safe and working with cell phone companies uh, to try to have warnings and, and monitoring of noise, uh, noise exposure. Uh, through smartphones. Uh, and so I think there's some very innovative things going on at the WHO with regarding to recreational noise. Uh, I want to just briefly uh, say a word about genetic causes. Uh, I recognize that from a primary prevention standpoint, uh, hopefully we'll have better, uh, better ways to treat and, and prevent hearing loss uh, from genetic causes as in, in the future with perhaps gene therapy, et cetera. But, but I think it, there's a couple of really common misperceptions and, and I think I just wanna share a, a little bit of work that we've done. Um, so hearing loss from genetic depends an awful lot on consanguinity in these environments. Uh, it's fairly high in the Middle East, also these isolated rural areas like we saw in Nicaragua. There's really very little data on non-US uh, populations. Uh, and there's a, an R01 grant, which I've been privileged to uh, be a part of by Reggie Cortez at the University of Colorado, looking at specifically at uh, Hispanic populations uh, because of the sort of lack of data. It, what we have found in Nicaragua uh, was that there were no connexin mutations in any of our 96 patients in Nicaragua. And this has really been borne out in studies in Africa and other multicultural uh, populations in the United States. I think we're, you know, we commonly say that uh, connexin accounts for 20 to 40 percent of congenital hearing loss, uh, but that's just really not true outside of Europe and the United States and perhaps China. And and Walter Nance, who I had the great pleasure of meeting many years ago at a House alumni event. Uh, has postulated that this reason why connexin is such a prevalent cause in, in our population is because of the fairly uh, robust deaf culture and assortive mating uh, over time. So as, as uh, with deaf culture, you have more deaf individuals uh, marrying other deaf individuals and that it just happened that connexin became the, the prevalent gene uh, that became sort of amplified uh, because of that. Uh, obviously, I, I realize a rather controversial uh, comment uh, thought, but I think it's an interesting, interesting science. So in our uh, study, this is a pedigree from a family in Nicaragua, multiply, multiply affected. And uh, so we did a little bit of work looking for uh, the causes. These are the, the audiograms of the unaffected individuals. We saw this progressive flat sensory neural hearing loss, which we've seen very commonly in this population uh, uh, in the affected individuals. Uh, we did uh, sort of a whole genome linkage uh, study and identified this one gene, which uh, was a, a candidate. And it turns out this is a, this is a gene called TECT-B. Uh, TECT-A uh, is known to uh, be associated with hearing loss, but this was the first time that Tect B had been um, had been identified and associated with hearing loss, and it actually segregates with the hearing loss of those in in our families. Uh, since we did this study, uh, there have been another family, I think, in Germany where they've also uh, found an association. And so, I think this is a great op great uh, uh, plug. Uh, for uh, for studying etiologies of hearing loss in these other environments, um, really shedding light on the basic physiology of hearing loss, uh, which gives us data which is useful in other ways. Um, just sort of very briefly to run through these other things, uh, 
meningitis uh, is, as you know, very common, particularly in the sort of meningitis belt of Africa. Um, uh, for those that survive uh, hearing loss, particularly from pneumococcal meningitis is fairly common. Um, and we, our, our recent data has suggested that a uh, little over 500, almost 600,000 new cases of centroderma loss uh, from uh, meningitis uh, each year. Uh, CMV, I think most of us appreciate uh, CMV as kind of an, emer we have an emerging awareness of CMV as a cause for congenital hearing loss. Uh, but what I, I, I'm not sure that we're all aware of is the strong socioeconomic uh, connection between CMV rates, prevalence rates. Um, and so uh, CMV is much more common uh, in, these, uh, in these lower socioeconomic countries. There's unfortunately still fairly limited data, um, but uh, we feel like that CMV will be an even larger a percentage of the congenital hearing loss in those in those low socioeconomic places, and then sort of the other miscellaneous, you can see that uh, measles, mumps, uh, rubella, and and malaria uh, all uh, contribute to to hearing loss uh, in these uh, low uh, resource environments. Uh, malaria is kind of uh, difficult because both the malaria and the and the quinine derivatives that are used to treat the malaria. Uh, are potentially ototoxic. And so sorting the, the disease versus, the, you know, which is worse, the disease or the treatment uh, becomes a little bit challenging in, in malaria. So I wanna end by uh, just uh, talking briefly about some work that I've been privileged to do with the Lancet Commission on Hearing Loss. Uh, this is headed by two people that I know all of you know uh, very well, Deb Tusi and Blake Wilson. And, um, we're hoping to have the uh, report of this out uh, next, uh, hopefully have our final draft by the end of this year uh, with publication by sometime uh, about this time next year. Um, I've uh, been privileged as an advisor of that group to work with two working groups, the primary prevention groups and the economic modeling group. And the, uh, the primary prevention group is, is looking uh, at these five specific uh, uh, primary preventable causes and, uh, and have come up with some very specific uh, primary and, and innovative primary prevention strategies. Uh, and I'm just going to have to, you'll just have to stay tuned for that because Deb and Blake would kill me if I, if I gave you too much of a sneak preview about that work. It's just been, it's been uh, three, three years in the coming. And so um, I'm, I'm a, I have a gag rule when it comes to the specific findings. But I can share with you some of the work that's been published through the economic modeling group, uh, working in conjunction with these uh, primary prevention groups. And this has been led by mainly by Ethan Bohr, uh, who's a PhD, can PhD MD candidate at Duke uh, right now. And, um, and what he's uh, done is developed a micro simulation model of hearing loss across the life course. And we've uh, published the validation of that model with, with US data and uh, have submitted a paper uh, which will apply the same model to Chile, uh, Nigeria, and India. Uh, and, then, and then working with the primary prevention groups to try to come up with more of a global feel for, for how different etiologies contribute to hearing loss. So this is how this micro simulation model works. You may be uh, familiar with this. It's uh, uh, similar to a Markov uh, model. So the idea is you enter here, you know, you're born with no hearing loss, and then you have various uh, uh, things, various etiologies that can cause uh, either uh, otitis media or sensory neural hearing loss. And each of those etiologies has a certain probability across the lifespan. So at each age, you have a different probability of getting these diseases. And so uh, the, the sum total of that is that then we can you know, run a million, uh, this is all computer-based artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning type stuff. So we run a million uh, people through this model and then we can get a, a sense for you know, what is the prevalence of different causes of hearing loss and the contributors of different causes of hearing loss. Um, or as, as, they, as, as Ethan calls it, the attributable portion 
uh, to a, an individual specific cause. Uh, this is some, uh, some of that data that we have looked at on Chile, India, and Nigeria. This is just looking at the overall rate of hearing loss across the age uh, spectrum. And uh, the, um, the, the, these are male and females plotted side by side. And this is looking at the global burden of disease estimates uh, and comparing it with the micro simulation estimates. And you can see that they're, they're actually pretty close. So that's you know, sort of makes us feel that we're on the right, on the right track. Uh, what we do see is that particularly in Nigeria, you see a lot more hearing loss in younger populations. Uh, and of course, Nigeria is by far the, the least, uh, the lowest resource of these uh, three, three uh, places. And so um, the next step, and this has been, um, been headed up by uh, Ethan and Kavita Prasad, uh, who's an uh, MPH, uh, MD a student at uh, Harvard or at uh, at Tufts, sorry, and is uh, doing a research fellowship at Vanderbilt this next year. And Kavita uh, and Ethan have uh, gone really deep, done a, a deep sort of meta analysis of the literature, looking at various uh, causes uh, of hearing loss, some of those etiologies that I've already mentioned. And, uh, and what are the exposed populations uh, from those various things. And so Kavita's data is shown here. Uh, I realize it's in a tablet form, but, but one of the things, so this is the column on the far right is really what I'd wanna draw your attention to. And these are, this is incidence. This is not prevalence. This is number of new cases per year. And as I've already gave you a couple of these data, a couple of these data points, uh, you know, about 600,000 uh, uh, for meningitis, you know, almost a million for otitis media. But when you look at aminoglycosides and, uh, and the anti-malarials, the, the, the quinine derivatives, because the exposed populations are so huge, uh, these play really significant uh, factors in terms of new cases. Of, uh, of hearing loss each year. So the next step in this uh, data is to stratify this uh, by age. We're gonna include the occupational noise uh, data, which we have fairly good, decent data on, to stratify this by age of exposure and duration of illness so that we can, we can come up with some prevalence estimates, and then also try to stratify it by hearing loss severity, which I think will be much more difficult. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna try to do that and give us some rough uh, rough idea about how much these things contribute to the overall prevalence of hearing loss. And so, if you remember, I showed you this this global burden of disease estimates, and I had made the point that you know one of the frustrating things is that we have this kind of large idiopathic uh, um, cause here. And and I'm hoping this is just kind of my kindergarten sort of, you know, uh, drawing here to sort of simulate what it might look like. But I'm hoping when all of this is said and done, that we'll be able to really better apportion uh, parts of this age-related and other category to, you know, to the things that are most common. And, and probably the, at least their initial data suggests that these ototoxic effects from the anti-malarial and the aminoglycosides are going to be huge. And then although all of these other things, the CMV, uh, rubella, et cetera, are relatively, are very important, uh, they play a, a relatively small uh, percentage of the overall uh, prevalence of hearing loss. And this just really helps us to sort of think about what do we need to do in terms of prevention? Where should our priorities be in terms of the prevention? And, and, and also uh, service delivery. So uh, in you know, conclusion, I think, I hope I've convinced you that hearing loss is really very, very, very prevalent and that most people are not treated, uh, that understanding the etiologies and the risk factors are, is really critical to primary prevention, uh, that, that you've got this really high variable, you've got a lot of zebras, a lot of variability in, low, in, in, in countries, especially for century earlier. And that ototoxicity is probably a really big contributor. Um, I think we definitely need more research to better understand this. 
And I think this sort of goes back to what I said about in the beginning about, uh, about Howard's uh, uh, inspiration and the inspiration of all of uh, my mentors uh, during my time is really sort of thinking comprehensively about the diseases we treat and, and the populations that we treat. Uh, not not just about the surgery that we have the next day, but really sort of thinking about how we can make hearing healthcare better for everyone. So uh, I, would, I do want to thank, this is an ever-growing list, and this is probably just only a partial list, but these are all of the people, various people that have contributed to parts of this uh, research uh, and, our, and the funding uh, that, that we have so far. And thanks very much. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, this uh, word from Margaret Mead. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.